Hi. In this lesson, we're going to discuss Article 4 of the Real Estate Code, which is subdivisions. So first of all, what's the definition of a subdivision in Arizona? Well, very simply put, it is six or more lots, parcels, or fractional interests created for sale or lease. So if you take a big piece of land and break it down into six or more parcels that you create for sale or lease, then you've created a subdivision. So let's see what subdivisions are all about. So let's say that you own the six acre parcel of land and you have your house on it. And in 2009, some years ago, you sold a piece. And then in 2010, another acre. And in 2011, you sold one. And in 2012 as well, you sold one. Have you created a subdivision? The answer is no, because you've created five, not six. But what happens if you then in 2013 created that six parcel and sold them off? Well, at this particular point, you have a subdivision. Why? Because you've created six or more. And the instant you sell or lease one of them, and you've sold or leased all five of those others, even though you still live on one, you've created a subdivision. Most of the time, subdivisions are created by home builders who take a big piece of land, break it down into 20 or 50 or a few hundred lots, build homes on them and sell those homes. But other times, subdivisions actually are inadvertently created by owners who are unaware of the subdivision law. Let's take a look at what the law basically says if you know you're gonna be creating a subdivision. First and foremost, a developer needs to create what's called a public report. This is also called a subdivision disclosure statement. And that's actually the correct name for this, but for so many years we called it a public report that that name sticks. And what a public report is basically is a statement of the material facts relating to this particular property. So, uh, why do you want to have a subdivision public report? Because for many years, swampland in Florida or beachfront property in and around Yuma uh, was sold with misleading information. So the public report is hopefully a statement of facts relating to that particular property. And what are the requirements? Well, first of all, some of the basic requirements are the name and address of the property owner, of the subdivider. You also would have to provide uh, liens and conditions of title. In other words, basically a title report showing what the liens on the property were and that the title was marketable. Also, what are the terms and conditions of the sale? So does the buyer have to put new financing on it or will the seller carry back financing, et cetera, et cetera. So there are whatever the terms and conditions that the subdivider is offering for sale, would have to be disclosed in the public report. One thing that's not required in the public report is an appraisal. In other words, an estimate of value, which is an opinion, not a statement of fact, would not have to be in the public report. Also, a plat. In other words, when a subdivision is created, the subdivider has to have a surveyor go out and survey the property and develop a subdivision map or a plat that would be recorded and from that particular point in time forward any reference to the legal descriptions would refer to the lot and or block numbers in that subdivision. Many subdivisions have restrictive covenants on them, covenants conditions and restrictions, CC and R's, as we talked about in, a, in another lesson. So those restrictive covenants would have to be included in the public report. Also required in any subdivision is provisions for permanent access. In other words, making sure that the buyer of a property has access to that parcel. Permanent access is defined in the statute actually as access by a conventional motor vehicle, not by a monster truck or some other big wheel, a big wheel situation, but permanent access is defined as access by a conventional motor vehicle. Now, why might a public report be denied? First of all, the public report has to be presented to 
the real estate department and for the real estate commissioner's review. But the public report might be denied because of the fact there's a problem with the title or because of the fact that certain improvements that are intended to be built may not be able to be built because the developer hasn't shown the financial capability to put those improvements in. Finally, water or the lack of availability of water if for a subdivision might be reason for denial. In what's called an active groundwater management area, an AMA, as we'll learn in another lesson, in order to create a subdivision in an AMA, the developer must provide what's called and obtain what is called a certificate of assured water supply from the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Sometimes that certificate is also called a 100-year certificate. But this makes sure that the buyers of those properties, if the subdivision is in an active groundwater management area, that the buyer will have the ability to have water. The developer prepares the public report and submits it to the real estate department for review and, and approval or issuance. The real estate department really does not approve or endorse any subdivision, but the real estate department wants to make sure that the subdivider has provided all of the information required under the law to any prospective purchaser. So, if a buyer comes in and wants to buy a property, the developer must provide the buyer with a copy of the public report. And the developer then must have the buyer sign a receipt acknowledging that they've received a copy of the public report. Once the developer gets that receipt from the buyer, the developer must keep that for five years along with other records Harkening back to our discussion in another lesson, where brokers have to keep records typically for five years. Now, what happens if a buyer comes into the subdivision before the public report has been issued and says, I want to buy that particular lot? Well, the subdivider cannot sell that parcel. What the subdivider may only do is to take a reservation. It's called a lot reservation. And there are some specific requirements relating to lot reservations. First of all, the maximum deposit that the subdivider can take for a lot reservation is $5,000. Secondly, that $5,000 or whatever the amount of deposit is must be placed in escrow. The developer cannot put that in his or her operating account. Then once the public report has been issued, that must be delivered to the buyer within 15 days of the public report being issued. Then that lot reservation will terminate within seven days of the buyer's receipt of the public report unless an agreement is signed. Should the buyer find that some of the terms and conditions outlined in the public report are not to the buyer's liking, the buyer then has the right to cancel the transaction, walk away, and get their lot reservation deposit back. What happens if a buyer buys a property, actually enters into a contract to buy a property and closes the transaction before the public report is issued? Well, in that case, the sale is rescindable by the buyer for up to three years. In other words, even after they've purchased the property, even after they've moved into the house, they have up to three years to rescind that transaction. Remember, this is if the sale took place before the public report was issued. Assuming a public report has been issued and the buyer gets a copy of it, the buyer has no right to rescind when the property is improved. In other words, it has buildings on it. Or if there's a contract to build a building on it, typically from a home builder. However, there are rights to rescind if a buyer signs a contract to purchase unimproved land in a subdivision from a subdivider. Let's take a look at those rights to rescind. So remember, this is only on unimproved land where a buyer is buying an unimproved parcel from a developer, from a subdivider. First of all, they have seven calendar days to rescind if they've seen the property. In other words, if they've been on the property, they've inspected it, they have a seven-day unilateral right to rescind the transaction. What if they haven't seen it? 
What if they bought it sight unseen, maybe on a friend's recommendation? Or years ago, they used to sell land at dinner parties across the country. And someone purchased the property, made their down payment, even closed the transaction. They would have six months to rescind that transaction. They would have six months to inspect the property and then rescind at that particular point in time. The idea behind these rights to rescind on unimproved land give buyers the ability to walk away from the potential pressure that they might feel and might undergo uh, in a face-to-face -face situation uh, with a salesperson. So remember, two rights to rescind, but only on unimproved land. Seven calendar days if they've seen the property, six months to inspect it if they have not seen the property. Let's take a few minutes and talk about lot splits. Lot splitting is a process of staying outside of the subdivision law. Let's say you had a parcel of land that you owned and you split it into two. Well, you're not a subdivider because you haven't created six or more. Well, actually, you can split up to five times. You can create five or fewer parcels, and you would be outside of the jurisdiction of the subdivision law. So creation of five or fewer parcels from one parcel does not create a subdivision. However, you have to be careful or your clients have to be careful because it would be illegal to orchestrate a scheme to circumvent the subdivision laws. In other words, let's say you had a 40 acre piece and you sold 10 acres to your brother, 10 acres to your father-in-law, 10 acres to your sister, 10 acres to your aunt and uncle. And each of those people in concert with you also took those 10 acres and split them into five pieces. So now you've got actually many more than five, many more than six, so you're a subdivider because of the fact you orchestrated a scheme. So you have to be very careful about that and make sure your clients are very careful about that. Now remember that parcel we talked about earlier where you own this one parcel and sold off a number of pieces. In this situation, you only created, we're back to only five, 2009, 10, 11, and 12. So you would not be considered to be a subdivider in that circumstances. But if you created that extra piece or extra sale in 2013, you would then be considered to be a subdivider. But there is an exception to this rule or exception to the statute, and that is what if you actually didn't sell that other piece off until 2023? Well, in that particular circumstance, under Arizona law, it would not be considered a subdivision because the sixth parcel was created more than 10 years after the fifth parcel. Be careful because if there was intent to circumvent the subdivision law by waiting that long, it would be considered to be a subdivision. Intent is rather difficult to prove. Now remember, if you created a subdivision, you were supposed to provide a public report, and if you fail to provide the public report, these transactions become rescindable. So here's the bottom line here. When you deal with clients in transactions, especially when they're buying land, which might be splittable, then you make sure you inform them of the subdivision laws. So what's a subdivision? Six or more parcels created for sale or lease. One of the things you also need to be aware of relating to subdivisions or actually non-subdivisions right, is what's called an affidavit of disclosure, also referred to as an affidavit of land disclosure. But it's not just for land, it's for any type of real estate. If the property is in the unincorporated area of the county, in other words, not in a city, and that property is not in a recorded subdivision, then an affidavit of disclosure is required to be delivered to the buyer by the seller in the transaction. Keep in mind that it's not just for land. It could be for vacant land, it could be for properties with homes on it, it could be for office buildings or shopping centers. It's called the affidavit of disclosure. Now, it requires disclosure of certain conditions, basically material facts. What's the situation with the water? What's the situation with sewer? What's the zoning? What are the easements? So it's kind of like a mini public report in that it is a disclosure document. And it's not recorded, not required, I should say, 
if the property is in a city inside a municipality or if it's in a recorded subdivision, even if it's in the unincorporated area of the county. Now, this affidavit of disclosure must be delivered to the buyer at least seven days prior to closing. That way, the buyer has the right to review the affidavit. The buyer may rescind it within five days after receipt, so they can rescind the transaction. If they're given the affidavit of disclosure at least seven days prior to closing, that gives them five days from receipt of it if they choose to rescind the transaction. So what should be done here is as soon as the buyer enters into a contract with the seller, the seller should provide that affidavit of disclosure right away to the purchaser, not wait until just before closing. The seller has to record this when the deed is recorded. So it's required that the seller deliver it to the buyer, that it be in recordable form, and it's the seller's requirement to record this along with the deed being recorded. Now there's a little bit of a map here of Pima County and I'm going to blow this map up on the right hand side to give you an idea of what we're talking about here with this affidavit of disclosure. So you can see the city of Tucson in red, you can see Marana and Oro Valley above that, and you see the whole brown area there, the unincorporated area of Pima County in and around Tucson. Also, by the way, Sawarita down in the, in the southern portion there is also a municipality. So if the property lies within any of the cities, then a affidavit of disclosure is not required. Also, if it, if it lies in any of the recorded subdivisions, and there are very a lot of those in the unincorporated area of Pima County, an affidavit of disclosure is not required either. However, if it falls outside of the city, outside of any of these recorded subdivisions, then the affidavit of disclosure is required. So that does it for our discussion on Article 4 subdivisions. In another lesson, we're going to get into and discuss timeshares.